So, Bill, are you saying that, that, that the inhibits have precedence, so to speak? Well, that's why they're called inhibit. They, they, if they don't meet criteria, you will get no feedback. Okay. Period. Okay. Yeah, does that meet cry? Uh -huh. Yeah. Is that meet? Is that making sense? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's complicate it. Let's turn that off. Let's go MIDI. Note for each component. Okay. Once we've chose, we've decided on this option. We have some other decisions to make. We go over to MIDI Voice. 128 different sounds to choose from. Okay. And this again is playing from your your SW synth or your software synthesizer built into your Windows program. Can you try out the Yes, from the training screen. Okay. So I've I've made a choice. I'm gonna go up here. I've made a choice to piano. MIDI style, sustained or percussive. This is where having a little bit of musical background helps. I am not a musical person whatsoever. I don't play any instruments. Unfortunately, Tom was. <laughs> yeah, and fortunately, Tom was. So, um, but looking at this, if you look at or you think about it for a little bit, you can usually figure it out. With piano, is piano a sustained or percussive type instrument? Percussive. Beautiful. Okay. Why is that important? Well, here's the only scenario that makes it important. Let's say we happen to leave it on sustained. If I have it on sustain, the person meets criteria and stays there. Let's say they're doing eyes closed alpha training and they cross over their threshold and they make this huge big alpha burst and they stay up there for a while. What's going to happen? They're going to hear the strike of the key, but the finger's going to hold down and they don't have a foot pedal. Okay? So they hear, you know, whatever the tone is and it fades away. They're still meeting criteria, but there's no sound. Versus if it's an organ, and it's sustained, the sound continues to play. If it's piano and it's percussive, keep striking the key. It's where the property of the instrument kind of makes sense to know it. Okay? Everybody clear with that? Once we made that decision, we got to look at modulation. I meet criteria, but I make a burst above. Does it go amplitude where it st starts very soft and then gets louder the more the higher the burst basically, or is it pitched as it go do 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 as I've gone way above threshold? Again, I need to make that decision. Okay. Is there an inverse pitch? No. Okay. But coming actually. In the event wizard, it's coming, not really coming for this part, but. Can we hear that too? Yep, same thing. You can do it from the training screen. Now, <laughs> let's get back to our little quiz. Bless you. MIDI, note for each component. Same scenario. Down delta, up theta, up alpha, down high beta. All four meet criteria. How many sounds? Two. Two. Beautiful. Okay. They all meet criteria except high beta. How many sounds? Zero. Beautiful. They all meet criteria except alpha. How many sounds? All right, you guys got it. Okay, does that make sense? All right. Now, coherence, if you were doing old school, I'll call it that, standard coherence, which it's not really very highly recommended, but it's available. You could choose coherent sounds, and then you have some decisions to make. You have to make all the MIDI decisions, but then we have to decide what is our starting threshold going to be for coherence. When I look at this number 10, what unit of measurement are we dealing with with coherence? This is hertz, mic microvolts. What is it? It's not correlation. I mean, I guess you could define it that way, but most people don't use that word. What, um, what word would be most commonly used with coherence threshold representation? Percentage. Percentage of coherence from one channel to the other. Just saying. Okay. Now, let's say we set this at 50. 
because we don't know exactly what the person's going to be, right, when they start. We then decide, are we going to train coherence or phase up and down? If we want to increase coherence, which one would we choose? Pretty simple one there, huh? I just seen who was awake. I just dissociated. <laughs> okay. And if we wanted to decrease coherence, we'd probably choose down. Okay. Now, after that, we have some decisions to make. What type of coherence algorithm might we want to use? Here's where it gets a little complex. Starting with training or similarity, the thing to keep in mind with this particular algorithm is it tends to be very useful from delta or lower frequencies up to around beta, around 15 to 17 hertz. Okay, then it starts to drop off its effectiveness. The reason being is this particular algorithm also has an aspect of phase built into it. As you get into the higher frequencies, you see less and less phase, thus the numbers get so small they're hard to work with, hard to train. Okay? However, if you're training in the lower frequencies and you're doing delta or, or um, theta or alpha or low beta type coherence training, this particular algorithm tends to be very powerful. Um, Dr. Jonathan Walker had done a small little um, comparative study using this algorithm versus the, the one that's next to it that says assessment peer and found in those lower frequencies this was much more powerful, moved the person much quicker. Okay? Now, let's say you are doing that higher, you're training beta or you're training high beta or gamma, then you need to be an assessment peer. No, no aspect of phase in the algorithm. Okay? Just straight coherence. Make sense? Now, when we measure coherence in z-scores or in Thatcher's database, which algorithm do you think we're using? Pure. Pure, correct. That's what this, that's where this one came from. Okay? Now, when we drop down and we go to SCC or spectral correlation, this is spectral correlation coefficient. This is the algorithm that's used in the lexicore in, for instance, like Kurt Lee Thornton uses for his connectivity measure. Okay, and this is actually comparing, when you look at the brain mirror display and you see that white line that's kind of like this running average, it's comparing the left side or the one channel to the other channel and how similar are those two. Spectrum shape. Right, spectrum shape, sure. Okay, does that make sense? Now as we drop over to the next one, we have comodulation or skill. This is what the connectivity measurement that um, David Kaiser and Barry Sturman use. And now what they're looking at is when you're looking at those filtered waveforms and you see the waxing and waning of the, of the filtered waves, they're going to compare channel 1 to channel 2, like the alpha to each other. How similar is that, those envelopes to each other? So it's like more shared amplitude between bands rather than the timing or the phase. Mm, I thought, and I don't know, maybe Don can help us with this one a little bit, that with co-modulation you're looking at both amplitude and timing with that. Because you're comparing the waxing and waning and when it's happening one channel to the other. Is that correct? It's strictly a time domain measure, so frequency has nothing to do with it. Neither does the size of one signal compared to the other. Okay, so it's all... time point, they have a very large alpha wave. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, there you go. Okay. 